Lewis, Lawes, Luz or Law, the forgotten land of legend's lore, will once more rise in the mind of man when they hear of the place where myths began, of holy men in search of minds, and did those feet in ancient times beguile a world of tyrannised men to leave the nest of the eagles then, where Septimius sailed to a harbour of wine and built a bridge to hold the line, now hidden by ghosts of railways past, whose trips to Uck were not to last. Like the Caesar before him, now at Sisbury Ring, who was guided to rest by the eagle's wing, with exotic animals they came to these shores, using shock and awe tactics for waging their wars. Up the Usa they sailed, in triremes made for battle, through a sea-flooded valley home to Celts and their cattle, where they took the land swiftly with superior forces, but the Regni fought hard from the backs of their horses. Yet soon they were slain or driven away, and the Romans, it seemed, were now here to stay. But for all of their power, they soon too would be gone from the mystical land once named Albion. Now we arrive at year 393, as Rome calls for aid and the soldiers must flee. With orders to leave and men on a bound, they gathered at port and put riches to ground. Storing away half a share of their treasures, they protected their hoard with extraordinary measures. Piled over with earth beneath strong Roman arches, and guarded by lizards that roamed in the marshes. Those man-eating dragons they called the Nicor, that poisoned the flesh and fed from the gore, would keep away all but the bravest of men, until such a time as Rome came once again, to the shores of the home they had conquered in vain, for their might crumbled swiftly and that day never came. So the Britons now left, abandoned or stranded, in large empty forts, together they banded, which leads us to tales of a time soon forgot, the magical era of good Camelot. Three hundred years now of battles ensued, as raiders fought farmers and stole all the food, and until such a time as for a morsel they strived, there was death and great famine until Wilfred arrived. He united the people and taught them to fish, and granted the belly its grumbling wish. So soon he was sainted, what a wonderful man, Wilfred had saved them at the village called Ham. Now quickly these hard times passed into history, and now we must learn of a baffling mystery, for Beowulf, it seems, was a man of our past, a born Anglo-Saxon whose legends spread fast, for not far away in the place they call Hallland, past the ring near the sea and the old go to war band, lived the man of the legend amongst local forged kings. I will tell you the tale of that Lord of the Rings. He was born in these lands from ancestors of old, and then rose to fame with vast gifts of gold, one from Hrothgar the king in the lands beyond Vendel, where he fought with a giant, an outlaw named Grendel. As Beowulf, he too had been made like an oak tree, a true living giant who stood seven foot three. He bested the beast and then fought with the mother, defeating them both so the king named him brother. He departed that island with a new worth to measure, crossed back over ocean with a boatload of treasure. At Kingston he landed by the barrows at Swan and proceeded to Hrethel, who had mourned while were gone, his greatest of warriors, his fiercest war band. So he granted him kingship and his own ruling land. Now, over at Ham he built a church for St Peter, where scribes penned his saga with a rhythmical metre. But down in the floodlands a lone dragon was stalking, the last of his line lived where no man went walking. Yet an exiled old thief found a hole in the side of the bank under Ham where he was looking to hide, but he stumbled on treasures of which we have spoken, retrieving a cup as a memorable token, which he presented to Beowulf and explained what he had found beneath the church on the promontory, a hoard underground. In exchange for protection, the thief led him there, where they noticed the dragon now entered the lair. It was a dangerous creature, no wise man would go near. Yet after a battle with Egbert, we hear, Beowulf took an injury that was stealing his health, so he took what was left and went for the wealth. And with Wiglaf he fought it at the mouth of the cave, and died there a hero, a man true and brave. They had both killed the dragon, and now claimed the gold that the Romans had left here in sad times of old. So with Beowulf they buried in a barrow on high, Vast treasures in that mound on the old Telscombe tie. The truth of this tale may be found on a coin 
the only true version from which we can join, those letters together and look in surprise. I do hope you see now, I tell you, no lies. But this tale is not over, for we now just begin to learn of St. Peter's and the home of the kings. For Athelstan met here with friend and with foe, where he created an empire at the Witans of Clove Show. For at Yulewick Corner his ancestors lay, at the foot of the eagle by the infamous bay, as on up the hill a pathway then brings us to the derelict home of the old Mayalingus. Please visit with care these old places of ghosts, pay respect to your past and your honourable hosts, then from your high vantage look downward to Ham, you can witness a place where a legend began. Imagine the lowlands filled with volumes of water that brought here the Vikings and burning and slaughter. We have seven more centuries before the sea here receded, when dams in an ice age killed ports now not needed. So back to our story, which may now cause you some fright, as we learn of the tale of the cursed Templar Knights. Templar Knights, of Hugh and of Godfroy on an old bow-backed horse, of nine hardy warriors setting a course to Solomon's temple up high on the mount. While receiving donations, it was too much to count to protect all the pilgrims on a perilous trail, with sword and with shield and with hardy chain mail. So soon on the hill they began to dig deep, to look for the treasure they went there to seek, to hunt out the ark which one day they did find, and then brought back to France their relic to mind. Their riches grew monstrous and soon became curse, for they funded two kings from their voluminous purse. Pitting one against other, they usurped all the power, but soon the Grand Master would be locked in a tower. For Philip the French King had tired of their hold, so on Friday the 13th he went for their gold. But the Templars, you see, they had known this was coming, and gathering their wealth they used all their cunning, stealing treasures away from that treacherous man, we come back once again to the vault beneath Ham. In 1307, on a dark moonless night, as they sailed up the ooze with their target in sight, the Templars were silent and all dressed in black, their standards were stowed, leaving no trace to track, for a tale of their presence to the king's ears might carry, so they planned to move fast, it would not do to tarry. They rode to the ox shoe, to the arched wall at Ham, then docked at the shore, and the offload began. Melendinus, the hospitaller, the parson at St Peter's, received the dark nights for the secret vault's keeper, had prepared for this day with masons and mortar as alterations were made in the church by the water. For the ark would not fit down that old Roman outlet, the precious gold relic he had known from the outset, would require a new way to reach the vaults down below, so a wall was removed as the records now show. A tunnel was widened and flagstones were made. There was no way to move them once the three had been laid. Their treasures offloaded, the ark made secure. They'd loose their standards past Wales to serve as a lure. For the king to pursue them in the far lands of the north, never once knowing they diverted their course. So now to this day, the ark waits entombed with the mains and the kings in the old catacombs.